This is Cerebral Cinema. Movies of the Mind. If the assistant director found the show ran too long, it became a matter of quickly sifting through each scene to determine what could be thrown out. If the timing came up short, it was a hurried trip to the phone to talk to Dennis Green, who would flesh out the story a bit more so the timing was right. Sometimes, with so little time left, the director would pencil in additional lines to pad the script. At this point, cast and crew would take a short break. Then, back to work. In order to get the timing absolutely right, a second read-through was held. The sound effects were added during this rehearsal, so everything would fit together. If it timed out correctly, then there was a final rehearsal. This was called the dress rehearsal. Everyone was on their toes, hearing themselves for the actual broadcast. The music was added, the sound effects were in place, the actors read their lines as they would during the actual broadcast, and the show went from beginning to end with no interruptions. Everyone tried not to stumble. After the dress rehearsal, final notes were taken. One year, the Sherlock Holmes show had a studio audience. That meant everyone in the cast had to spruce themselves up, dress in neat, good-looking clothes, and not only perform for the millions of radio listeners, but for the hundred or so seated in the studio. As the second hand slowly reached towards the on-air time, the actors took their places at the microphones as the director and assistant director returned to the control room booth. The orchestra leader raised his baton, and the sound effects men grabbed for those strange objects that would create the necessary sound effects. When the second hand reached 12, the director pointed to the announcer, Joseph Bell. Kremel Hair Tonic presents The New Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring... And so it went, for one solid half hour, straight through, from beginning to end, live, heard on millions of radios across America. And when Joseph Bell, at the end of that night's broadcast, said this is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. That was it. Everything shut down, and another broadcast of Sherlock Holmes became history. So it went, week after week, for a full 39-week radio season. And now, with radio drama considered a dead medium, who would have thought that someone back then had been wise enough to save recordings of these shows? All these years later, we can listen to them once again. Why don't we do just that? Here, for your listening pleasure, are Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson in a fine adaptation of the original Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Adventure of the Lion's Mane. Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Well, here we are again visiting the genial Dr. Watson in his cheerful study. We sit back in our comfortable chair and wait to hear another exciting story. What could be pleasant? Uh, you go again, Mr. Bell, flattering me again. If only Sherlock Holmes were here to make the picture complete. No, Mr. Bell, you know that's impossible. He retired to Sussex years ago and took up bee farming. I suppose you visited him there. Naturally. As a matter of fact, I remember one Saturday towards the end of July in 1907 that Is we... Is this the beginning of a story, Dr. Watson? I should be surprised. But hadn't you better have your word with our listeners first? Yes, Dr. Watson, I had. Men... I'm sure you'll be interested to learn that a recent survey showed that Kremel Hair Tonic is preferred among America's top flight executives and most successful men. But after all, why shouldn't it be? Kremel contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. This is why Kremel gives a man's hair such a natural, well-groomed look. Such a handsome, clean-cut appearance. Kremel always keeps the hair neatly in place longer with an attractive, healthy-looking luster. 
Yet it never leaves your hair looking or feeling greasy, sticky, or dirty. After you apply Cremel, you can rub your hand over your hair and your hair always feels so delightfully clean. Notice, too, how no greasy film comes off on your hand or hat band. Just use a little Cremel on your hair in the morning, and at night your hair looks as neatly groomed as when you first combed it in the morning. Remember, no other hair tonic keeps your hair more handsomely groomed. K-R-E-M-L, Cremel Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, I'm all ears. Well, I was paying Holmes one of my frequent visits. His cottage is situated on the southern slope of the Sussex Downs, commanding an excellent view of the English Channel. At this point, the coast is made up of chalk cliffs, which can only be descended by a single tortuous path, which is steep and slippery. At the bottom of the path, there are curves and hollows, which make splendid swimming pools, and are filled afresh with each flow of the tide, and warmed by the sun. What town is Mr. Holmes' place near? A village called Falworth. But even that is at a distance, and the house is quite lonely. Half a mile away is Holmes' only neighbor. And who is that? Harold Stackhurst, who's the headmaster of the well-known preparatory school, the Gables. A private school, I suppose you'd call it. It was summer, and most of the boys were away on holiday, except a few who were catching up. The teaching staff was reduced to three. First of all, there was Harold Stackhurst himself, who was an old pal of mine. We went to school together. He was a splendid fellow and a well-known blue for rowing in his day. Assisting him were two younger McPherson, red-headed and cheerful. In summer and winter, he went for his morning swim. Winter swimming? Quite a spartan. <laughs> yes, indeed. The other schoolmaster was Ian Murdoch, a tall, dark man, taciturn and aloof, with occasional outbursts of temper. The villain of the piece, hmm? There you go, anticipating again. Oh, sorry. Let me stop this. Well, it was early one morning, just after sunrise. There'd been a severe gale the day before, but the wind and the waves had finally abated and everything looked newly washed and fresh. The air had a decided nip to it, and Holmes and I were on our way down to the beach for our morning start. I say, Holmes, that water's blue this morning, isn't it? Rather cold looking, if you ask me. Do you good, Watson. Your circulation needs toning up. You can run all the way home. Run up the cliff path? Hmm. That's the hard. Rubbish. The boys do it. Well, I'm not under the delusion that I'm still in my first youth. <laughs> Hello. Isn't that Stackhurst coming along the cliff? He's got a towel over his arm, obviously going down to the beach. He's not afraid of a little cold water. And he's almost as old as you are. He's older. Oh? Oh, thank you, Lola. He was two forms above me at school. Dear, dear, quite an old man. I had no idea oh, that... Stop ragging me, Holmes. Hello there, Sackhurst. Hello. Hello. Going swimming? Yes, wait for us. Come on, Watson. Oh, bless my soul if it isn't Watson. Delighted to see you, old chap. I thought you weren't coming down for another month. Well, I just couldn't stay away any longer. I'm so fond of the swimming here. Yes, know. Watson has just been saying that there's nothing like a good dip before breakfast to tone up the system. <coughs> What did you say, Watson? Oh, Stankhurst, where are your two young assistants? McPherson and Murdoch, the gloomy Scott. I've never known them to miss their matutinal plunge. Oh, well, Murdoch has had to keep some of the boys at their algebra. He'll be along later. Uh, McPherson has gone on ahead. I expect he's in the water now. Any more outbursts of temper on Murdoch's part lately? No, not since last week, when he found a boy putting toads in his bed. <laughs> His temper is ferocious, Holmes. I suppose I should give him dismissal, but he's such a confoundedly good teacher. A little bit of temper won't harm the boys now and then. Help to keep them in line. Yes, I'll wager the next fellow who wants to put extraneous objects in Murdoch's bed will think twice about it. Look, there's someone staggering up the edge of the cliffs. Yes, he's in bathing trunks and an overcoat flapping in the wind. What's the matter with him? Drunk, probably. Look at him, real. A fine example for my boys. Then who the devil can it be? It's... Yes, it's McPherson. I could tell that red hair anywhere. He's trying to wave to us. I've never known him to behave like this. He's not drunk. He's in agony. He needs help. Harry Watson, run. I say, he, he's fainted. No, no, no. He's, he's trying to get up again. Help! Help! Well, he's writhing on the ground. Courage, old boy. We're coming. Pain. Pain. I can't breathe. He's killing me. What is it? What's happened to you? <laughs> The name. The lion's name. But, good heavens, he's having convulsions. His face is turning purple. Yeah, now he's stopped. Thank heaven. How is he, Watson? 
I can't see him breathe. He, uh... Wait a minute. Yes, he's... He's dead. Some terrific shock. His heart gave out. Look. He's bitten through his lower lip. The paroxysm of his agony. What could it have been? He's not wounded. No signs of a struggle. Take that coat off. Let's take a look at him. Easy now, easy. Good heavens, Holmes, his back. Just look at his back. Great red welts. Round his shoulders and round his ribs. Oh, this is terrible. What was it he tried to tell us? He said something about a lion. A lion's mane, to be exact. Well, you don't think he's being clawed by a lion? Or some wild beast in this part of England? It, it, it's, it's unthinkable. Quite. Besides, the claws of an animal would have dug deeper. These welts are inflamed and there are little red spots at certain intervals. It looks as if someone has used a lash on him. A thin iron scourge with knots. Poisoned knots. Who could it have been? There'd been no one along the edge of the cliff. And we can see for miles. No, no, on the beach. There are some fishing boats, but they're too far out. I wonder... Uh, did anyone bear him a grudge? Did he quarrel with anyone? Why, no. Uh, that is not recent there. I... Hello. What's up? Why do you all look so serious? Well, hello, Murdoch. Where did you come from? The classroom. I just left the boys. But what's the matter with McPherson? What's he lying like that for? He's dead. Murdered. He's been flogged to death. Dead? It's horrible. Who could have... We don't know. Is there anything I can do? Yes. Yes, go back to the house. Send for the police and keep the boys indoors. I don't want them mixed up in this. Certainly, of course. Dead, I... I can't believe it. Stankhurst, you stay here with the body. Watson and I will go down to the beach to see what we can find. Good. But don't be any longer than you can help. Come along, Watson. Here's the path leading down the face of the cliff. The only path for miles. He was attacked down on the beach. The murderer is still there. I say, he may be armed. I'd better go back for my revolver. Suppose the murderer goes for us. Oh, rubbish. Come along. There's no time to waste. They escape. Careful. There's prey here. Slippery. Look, Holmes. Footprints. Yes, the same one's descending and then returning again. But first, none doubt it. That means no one else has been to the beach by this path since the storm. Here's the mark of his hand where it fell. And the print of both knees. That's all that the path holds for us. Now for the beach itself. Look, look, there's quite a lagoon left by the tide. His towel is lying beside it. Folded and dry so he didn't enter the water. There's his sweater beside the pool. Look here, on the sand, footprints. Naked and with a canvas shoe. Presence again, that proves he made ready to bathe, but the towel shows he returned without bathing, or at any rate, without drying himself. Well, look, Holmes, there are some distant figures up there on the beach. Mm, too far away. Besides, this lagoon lay between them and the person. Perhaps the fishing boat. Perhaps, but I can see no sign of a boat having been beached along the shore. Yes, but then, uh, who, uh, how... Uh... Quite. Could it be Stackhurst? We saw him coming from the direction of the gables. Hmm. How about Murdoch? He has a glowering look. I don't trust him. Do you think that he really was up at the school with the boys? That is an alibi we shall have to look into. Uh, hello, Stackhurst. Why did you leave a body? Uh, Murdoch set down one of the gardeners to stand watch over it, so I, I came along. Besides, I, I just thought of something. Yes? Uh, you asked if anyone had a grudge against McPherson, and I, I thought I ought to tell you. Go on. Well... About a year ago, this chap Murdoch was rather fond of a girl down in the village. But Macpherson cut him out. So Murdoch didn't seem to mind at the time, but about two months later, Macpherson and Murdoch had a pretty bad row. So Murdoch was always a bit fiery, you know. Well, when Macpherson's dog got excited, he went for Murdoch, and Murdoch went into one of his rages and threw the animal out of the window. Well, the dog wasn't hurt, and the, the quarrel was patched up. At least so we all thought. But you never know. The sentiment sometimes smoulders for a long time. Yeah, particularly if there's a woman in the case. Quite. Well, let's have a look at the towel and sweater. We've seen everything else there's to see down here. Hello. There's something in the pocket of the sweater. Hmm. It's a note. Dear me. A note of assignation. Well, huh? what's it say? We'll be there in the same place, darling. Oh, until there you are, then, woman. All my love, Maudie. Why, that's the girl. The one I told you about, Maud Bellamy. McPherson was in love with her. Obviously. This whole affair has upset me so. It may give the school a bad reputation. 
It was only by chance that several of the boys weren't with McPherson when it happened. I say, was it chance? After all, it was Murdoch who held him back. He was the one who insisted on algebra before breakfast. At present, I'm more interested in this girl than in Murdoch. Suppose we take a walk to Falworth and call on her. Uh, I do. I'm with you. Come along. Well, not so fast, Watson, not so fast. We'd better dress first. We might cause quite a stir parading down the village streets in these costumes. Remember, you've still got your bathing suit on. Yes, sure I have. And I've forgotten all about how, how chilly it was. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll find out what Sherlock Holmes discovers in his visit to Maud Bellamy. Men, I'm sure you'll agree that well-groomed hair adds a great deal to a man's appearance. And one of the first requisites of handsome, healthy-looking hair is a hygienic scalp. So start at once and take better care of the hair you've got. If you're smart, you'll use Kremel hair tonic. No other hair tonic keeps the hair more neatly in place without looking or feeling greasy. But Kremel does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. Kremel's light oils have a grand lubricating effect on a dry scalp. At the same time, Kremel removes itchy, loose dandruff. Notice how alive, how tingling your scalp feels. And men, you like to massage Kremel on your scalp because it's such a clean product. It never feels greasy or sticky. And if your hair, like so many men's, is so dry that it breaks off and falls when you comb it, Kremel actually helps condition the hair in that it makes it feel softer, more pliable, and look as if it had some body to it. So for handsome, groomed hair and a more hygienic scalp, use Kremel daily. Buy a bottle of Kremel at any drugstore. Ask for an application at your barber's. K-R-E-M-L, Kremel hair tonic. That famous modern hair tonic which has become such a nationwide favorite. Now, Dr. Watson, you dressed and went over to Falworth to call on McPherson's girl. Is that right? Yeah, that's right, Mr. Bell. Stackhouse pointed the house out to us. That's the Bellamy house over there, Mr. Holmes. The one with the corner tower and the slate roof. Maud is the daughter of old Tom Bellamy, who owns all the boats and bathing huts at Falworth. He was a fisherman to start with, but uh, now a man of some substance, I believe. Yes, judging from the house, he must have come up in the world. And Maud is the prettiest girl for miles around. Quite a beauty, in fact. She must have had scores of admirers. By Jove, look who's coming out of the front gate. Say, it's Murdoch. And what in thunder is he doing here? Hey there, Murdoch. What do you mean by coming over here? I thought I... am I told... your subordinate, sir, under your own roof. I am not aware that I owe you any account for my private actions. Your answer is pure impertinence. So is your question. This is not the first time that I've had to overlook your insubordinate ways. But it will certainly be the last. You will make arrangements to leave my school as soon as possible. I intend to go in any case. I've lost the only person who made the Gables habit work. Insolence. How dare he, young whippersnapper? Mrs. Stackhouse, he seems very eager to clear out of here. Perhaps you were a trifle hasty in giving him an excuse to go. I never thought of that. Uh, shall I tell the police to place him under arrest? No. We can prove nothing against him as yet. Better persuade him to stay until we are sure he didn't do it. Very well. It's against my principles, but I'll, I'll go after him and see what I can do. Splendid. Now, Watson, suppose we call on Miss Bellamy and present our condolences. I take it that Mr. Murdoch has already broken the news of the tragedy. Ring the bell, that's a good fellow. Don't you think it's a, a bit heartless, Holmes, calling at this time? If the girl has any character at all, she will want to help us discover the murder of her sweetheart. Any woman with any... What do you want? We would like to speak to Miss Bellamy. Well, you can't. You are her father, I take it. Yes, I'm her father, and I know you be, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. And I'm not having you mixing my daughter up in any of your dirty business. I thought you might want to help us solve the murder. Ah, you did, did you? Well, I'll have you know, I consider Mr. McPherson's attentions to my maud was insulting. And my son, William, is of the same mind. Letters and meetings, but never a word of marriage. I'll not have you breaking her out. I'll not have her name dragged That's through the... That's all right, Father. I know that Fitzroy is dead. I want to help find his murderer. I'll not have you mention... This is me. my business, Father. Let me manage it in my own way. I'll do anything you say, Mr. Holmes, to help bring them to justice. Why do you say them? Mr. McPherson was not a weakling. He was brave and strong. No single person could have inflicted such an outrage on him. Uh, one thing more. We found this note in the dead man's pocket. Can you throw any light on it? 
Did he go down to the beach expecting to meet you? No. I sent it. It's true. But we were to meet tonight. I see no reason for mystery. We were engaged to be married. We only kept it secret because Fitz didn't want to be ragged by the boys at the school. Here is my engagement ring. Well, you might have told me. I would if you had shown a little more sympathy, Father. But the note, it didn't come by post. Who was your go-between? I'd rather not answer that question. It really has nothing to do with the matter. Do you realize that this go-between was the only person who knew of your meetings with young McPherson? Had he any reason to resent him? That's no business of yours. You had many suitors, I believe. <laughs> that she did. Was Ian Murdoch one of them? There was a time when I thought he was. But all that was changed when he found that Fitzroy and I cared for each other. Miss Bellamy, do you think it natural that a hot-tempered young fellow like Murdoch would get over his feeling as easily as that? What are you trying to make me say? If you think Ian Murdoch had anything to do with a murder, you're wrong. A finer man never drew the breath of life. He wanted us to be happy. He wasn't the kind to think of himself first. He'd gotten over his feeling for me. Then why did he want to be the first to tell you the news of your fiancé's death? Because he was Fitzroy's friend. He thought it was his duty. He thought he... What does it matter? This is dead. Why don't you find his murderer? What's the good of all this? Hmm. Thank you for your information, Miss Bellamy. Leave me alone, can't you? Leave me alone. Go and find the murderer if you're so clever. Perhaps we shall. Well, good day. Hmm. Looks like another black wall to me, Holmes. Perhaps. But even that is enlightening. There are only so many possibilities, Watson. We may finally arrive at the correct solution by crossing off all the rest. detective on a case you seem extraordinary like a day school. You spent the better part of the last three days up in your garret among your books. I've been looking for the solution, something I once read. It's in the back of my mind, but I can't seem to bring it into the light of my consciousness. Yes, and in the meantime, this Murdoch fellow may slip through our fingers. Once he leaves the school, we'll never be able to get our hands on him again. I wonder that he has, hasn't left before this. Oh, how can you sit there so calmly and say that, Holmes? You're losing your grip. Perhaps I am, perhaps I am, I... If I could only find the fact that I'm looking for. It began with a C. I swear it began with a C. Well, then, how about the old encyclopedia there? Look up all the C's in the book. But I'm not sure it is C. Oh, Holmes, you're being exasperating and exaggerating. You know that the murderer didn't escape along the beach or even climb the top of the cliff. But did it ever occur to you that it, it might see be, be somebody hiding in one of those caves? Some sadistic maniac? Yes, it did occur to me. But it's not possible. I searched every one of those caves and there's no trace of human habitation in any of them. Oh, and my theory of the sadistic maniacs were wrong. Yes. Huh? Oh, huh? And horrible as that theory sounds, I'm convinced that the truth is even more horrible. That death came from the sea. And the truth is more ghastly than anything you can imagine. Oh, you make the chills run down my spine. I must say, I shall never have the courage to go swimming down there again. And a wise thing, too. At least for some time. Well, I must say, I don't see how young Murdoch has the nerve. Murdoch? Murdoch went swimming down on that beach? When? About a quarter of an hour ago, I saw him go by with a towel over his arm. Why didn't you tell me? Come on, we must bring him back. Poor boy, he hasn't a chance. Oh, good heavens, Holmes. I had no idea. Look. Something's happened. Someone's coming up the path. Stackhurst. He's carrying someone on his back. By thunder, it's Murdoch. And he's in bathing trunks. Help! Holmes! Watson! Something's happened to murder! What is it? It's the same thing that killed young McPherson. I met him, I met him staggering up the face of the cliff. He was too far gone for me to get him home, so I, I brought him here. Put him on the couch. Uh, have a look at him. His heart is giving out. He can hardly breathe. His face is turning quite black. Here, quick, Holmes. Pour me out a glass of that brandy over there. Right. Hold his head while I, I try to get it down. That's it. That's it. If he can only swallow. 
Now, some more. That's better. Take the bottle. You can't give it too much. His, his color is coming back. He's, he's beginning to breathe again. His heart is getting stronger. Look, it, he's trying to talk. It lashed me in the water. It lashed me. Now I remember. In the water, of course. The pain. It's terrible. I can't stand it. Give me something. Morphine. Anything. I don't give him a sense of it. It might affect the heart. Holmes, here, get the cotton wool there and the, and the olive oil. Right. Uh, what is it? It's a poison of some kind. It affects the nerves, apparently. Must be terribly painful. Here's the stuff you wanted. Good. But now saturate the cotton wool. The dressing on his back. Now, that's right. You must use plenty of oil. There we are. That's better. Oh, that's much better. By Jove, he's fainted. I don't think so. He's just fallen asleep from sheer exhaustion. Well, Watson... How's our patient coming along? Splendidly. Uh, the nurse says we can move him tomorrow. Splendid physique that boy must have had to stand up under the strain. I says, Tackers, we all owe that chap an apology for suspecting him of uh, McPherson's death. Yes. But who in thunder did kill him? I'll show him to you, if you like. You, you discovered the murderer? Yes. One of the most gruesome instruments of torture ever devised. He is waiting for us at the foot of this cliff. Yes, but is it safe to go down? You said that... Murder... Yes, if you don't go too near. Come along. All right, if you say so. Well, the tide's coming in. I don't see any murderer. I mean... No, he's not as obvious as all that. Treacherous as well as deadly. I must say that this place gets on my nerves since the tragedy. I, I haven't allowed the boys to go in swimming lately. I, I suppose it's foolish of me. I... On the contrary. You would have had a few more tragedies if you'd allowed them to swim. This death strikes like lightning. There's no escaping it. But, great God, if, if it's as dangerous as all that, we'd better get back up the cliff before, before the murderer finds us. We're quite safe unless we take a dip in the lagoon McPherson went swimming in. That's what I thought you said, that he, he didn't go into the water. So I did. The towel fooled me. The truth of the matter is that he was in such agony when he came out that he failed to use the towel. That's what threw me off the track in the first place. But the murderer? Down here. Where's he? Under the cliff where the lagoon is quite deep. Ah, there's your murderer on that rocky shelf about three feet below the surface. Look down there. See it? Why, it's a tangled mass. Great Scott, it's alive. It's vibrating and waving. A hairy creature with streaks of silver amongst its, its yellow stresses. Oh, what a, what a foul and sinister thing. Sinister enough. The death that comes from the sea... As fatal as a cobra and more far-reaching. That is Cyanea, the fearful stinger, sometimes called the lion's mane. Well, I've been born and bred in these parts, and I've never seen anything like it. Ah, look at that foul thing. Well, it doesn't belong to Sussex, I swear. Just as well for Sussex. The southwest gale must have brought it up. What do you say? Shall we end this murder forever? Mm -hmm. We end it by all means. Very well. I think this boulder should do the trick. Help me move it. It's too heavy for one man. Right. Oh, there she goes. Good. The boulder settled right on the filthy creature. Pinning it to the ledge. One edge of yellow membrane is still flapping. Not for long. Notice the oily scum oozing out from under the stone and rising slowly to the surface. That is the end of the killer. Lion's mane. I've never heard of that before, Dr. Watson. Uh, Mr. Bell, neither did I. Holmes discovered the article that he'd been searching for and read it to us. The full name of the dreadful creature is Sinea... Capillata. It radiates almost invisible 
filaments to the distance of 50 feet. Within that radius, it is as deadly and far more painful than the bite of a poisonous snake. Ladies and gentlemen, in just a moment, Dr. Watson will be back to tell you about next week's story. But first... Cerebral Cinema hopes you have enjoyed this movie of the mind.